Hello, and welcome to Pan Society Radio, your home for modern animism. I'm Laura Giles, your host for today's show. Thanks so much for joining us today. Our mission here at Pan Society is to help bring animism into your everyday life, and that can be a challenge sometimes because it's such an enormous topic. Everything's related to everything else. And today, I'm going to be talking with Christian de la Huerta, who actually has a similar mission. He's the author of Awakening the Soul of Power, and today we're going to share some ideas of how to look at power and the divine masculine. So let's start by acknowledging and giving thanks to the ancestors and the elements. I acknowledge the element of earth, and thank you for keeping us grounded and stable. Thank you for all the wonderful, flavorful things that are coming out of the garden right now and nourishing our bodies. Thank you for the bounty. I acknowledge the element of air, and thank you for discernment. It's time um, for a lot of information that's coming my way right now, and those air qualities of non-attachment and discernment are so much appreciated right now. I acknowledge the element of fire, and thank you for the inner fire that's burning with us here at Pan Society as we grow and bring new things to life for you, like our new online class. And I acknowledge the element of water and thank you for helping us to flow past the rough spots in life to go deep and to pop right back up. I acknowledge our loving, helping ancestors who are always looking out for us. I thank you for your support, guidance, and love always. Please continue to speak to us in words and symbols that we understand so that we never miss your messages. Thanks to all of our listeners who listen, share our podcast, ask questions and comments. If you like what you hear, please return that love by reviewing us on iTunes. It helps our podcast rating and helps us to reach more people. And if you'd like to help with a financial donation, you can do that on our website at pansociety.net. Thanks so much. So as I said, Christian De La Huerta is our guest today. He's a sought after spiritual teacher, personal transformation coach, and leading voice in the breathwork community. He's traveled the world offering inspiring and transformational retreats, combining psychological and spiritual teachings with lasting and life-changing effects. And his book, Awakening the Soul of Power, appeals to me because to me, that's the fire element, that's sovereignty. And while the book goes into many ways that power shows up, I wanna to focus today on power and the divine masculine because I think that gets too little attention. So welcome, Christian, how are you? Hey, Laura, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the show. And I love how you opened up with that beautiful acknowledgement to the elements and the asset ancestors. Thank you. And thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. It's, a, it's an honor. But can you give us a little backstory on how all of those things, uh, that you, how, did you, how did you get to all of that and get to here? Was there a turning point in your life, a great mentor, a father? Um, you know, I've always had a sense of, of mission since I was a kid, and I was the kind of kid that everybody came to for advice. Um, and I grew up in a really Catholic environment, so at that time, I translated that as, you know, thinking that I wanted to be a priest. Um, and in my teenage years, discovered that that religion didn't have space for me, didn't have room for me. So like many people, I threw the, the baby out with the baptismal water. Um, and most of my 20s, you know, I was, I was you know, I was, I was pretty successful. I had a, a nice job. I was making good money. I was sought after socially, professionally, condo on the water, um, sports car, the Armani suits, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and the more that I had uh, and the more that I was sought after, the more that it started feeling to me like there has to be more, uh, like there was something, something missing. And through, I, so I think the turning point was as I was approaching 30, I went through this, you know, I don't know if it was premature, but I went through this kind of questioning crisis, a, an existential crisis, like, what am I really here for? And um, I went through a real deep process of discernment. Um, like I spent a whole weekend by myself and just didn't watch TV, didn't listen to music. I just like lived in the question of what do I want from life? And I compiled a list of like a hundred things and it could be like really big, ambitious, uh, you know, things, or it could be completely petty. And, and then I started a process of eliminating what do I really want from life and got it down to three. And, and that process was catalytic. Um, and, you know, like, like, like you teach and, and like animism teaches, everything is connected. So me getting so clear about that, um, Within six months, I, I was led to a teacher and I was led to breath work. And I had been on a, on a path to 
to get a PhD in psychology. My dad is, was a psychiatrist. So I come out of that psychotherapy tradition. And when I did breath work for the first time, it was like, just blew everything away. And I jumped tracks. I never went for the PhD. And, you know, it's, that was the beginning of my my spiritual journey and then i started you know looking eastward for for my spiritual connection and, and sustenance yeah breathwork is amazing uh how did you focus on power as so i know that's your book maybe i'm assuming um that's your your thing is power how did you get to that well you know um a couple of things triggered that. I I think one, I mean, one was I was sitting in meditation some probably 10 years ago, maybe longer. Um, and only for the second time in my life, now it's happened three, but but at that point it was only twice that I actually heard audible words. Like, yeah. you know, and and the words were the soul of power. And I wasn't thinking about anything related to that. It's like, oh, what an interesting thing. And I got up from meditation, got the URL, because I thought, well, that's interesting, and forgot about it. A couple of months later, I was um, had, had just submitted um, a proposal, a book proposal to an agent, literary agent that I was working with in New York. And so she, on a different theme, and she sent it back, and she said, yeah, great, I want to work with you. But before we pitch it to a publisher, I want to, um, I'd like to see some of these marketing ideas implemented, which would have taken me a year to implement. So it's like, you know, ee, putting on the brakes, screeching halt, because I was already spending the advance in my mind. And in that, what do I do now moment, um, like in a few days that I was like, right, what am I going to write if I'm not going to write for an advance? What would I really write about? And then I had this realization. Um, I've been saying for years that the single most important thing that needs to happen in the world is the empowerment of women, because to that we can connect all the other issues that we face. And it's, it's not to put women up on a pedestal. It's not to idealize women. Women are also capable of abusing power. It's not to give women more crap that they have to clean up in this world of ours. Um, it's because as a species as a world, we've been running so off balance in terms of the, the masculine and feminine energies. So I've been saying that for years. And then I thought empowerment of women, soul of power is like, huh, it's like one of those palm to the face moments where, you know, to the forehead moments, like, duh, like, how do we do that? How do we express power in a different way that is not hierarchical, that is not about power over, that doesn't require that, you know, that's not about force, about fear, about domination, about manipulation, that's not a, that doesn't require that we push anybody down, step on them, press our knee to their neck in order for us to feel powerful. How do we do it in a different way? And so that's what got me thinking about all this stuff. Awesome. Okay. So I'm not a guy. I need your perspective. Um, how would you say that boys are taught to handle power? Is it different than the way that girls do it? Well, I think all of us, you know, regardless of what kind of body we're in, for the last, you know, several thousand years that we've been in this patriarchal system, we've we've got this more patriarchal approach to power, which is power over. And and I, what I've realized is, like, I've been doing retreats on this theme now for probably 10 years um, and, and testing out some of the concepts and ideas and, and putting them into practice. And, and what I've come to realize is that most of us have an ambivalent, conflicted relationship to power. Like, part of, it want, part of us wants it, part of us is afraid of it. And I think what we fear is couple of things. We, we fear that if we really stepped into all of our power and to, and to really fulfill our potential, our unique human potential, that other people wouldn't be able to handle it and that we might end up alone. We also fear that we might abuse it. And, and no wonder, like all we got to do is turn on the news any given day to, to witness at least one abuse of power. Combined with that, to the fact that we have been conditioned to believe that power is a bad thing. You know, like power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. What they didn't tell us about that quote is that Lord Acton was specifically speaking about political power, not personal power. Mm -hmm. So add to that mix the fact that we've been conditioned to believe that the emotions are weakness, 
right? When the emotions are neither strength nor, nor weakness, as, as animism, animism teaches, everything is energy. That includes the body. That includes the emotions. So the emotions are just energies that course through our bodies, but we've labeled them weakness. And, and so when you put all that into a mix, what happens is that we end up rejecting our power. We give it away. Our inherent, innate power that nobody can give to us Nobody can take it away. We are the only ones who can give it away. And the sad part is that we give it away for kind of lame reasons, you know, for an illusion of security, for um, a false sense of acceptance, and for morsels, crumbs of, of pseudo love. And so I think we all do that. And I think men in particular um, pay a price. Like, you know, this patriarchal power over system, like, of course, has been unacceptably and then it's just no longer acceptable in terms of the inequity and the lack of justice and the oppression of women and the oppression of the denial of the feminine and men have also paid a price for that um, and continue to pay a price so, so let's just look at, at a couple of numbers briefly um, the rate of suicide in the u.s is men commit suicide four times as frequently as women do and 70% of the suicides in this country are committed by middle-aged white men, which we could say, you know, still it's the group that still holds most of the power in the world. Mm -hmm. In terms of longevity, um, women outlive men by five years in this country, by seven years globally. And so what's up with that? You know, and, and I think that part of the reason for that is that we have this twisted um, idea of what it means to be a man. And so, you know, because we've been so conditioned since, since a young age, little boys don't cry, it's like just embedded into our brains, um, that, that we, we have this erroneous misunderstanding of what it means to be a man. And so we walk around like these unfeeling robots. And because of what we were talking about, the energies, the emotions being energies, it's like just because we suppress them and we don't allow ourselves to feel them, doesn't mean they go away, right? They, 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 when we suppress them, they get stuck, they get suppressed into the tissues of our bodies. And those energies can only, two, only two things can happen. Either, either we suppress, 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 and then the next unfortunate one comes by and they rub us the wrong way and say something the wrong way or do something and we explode inappropriately to that situation and we cause harm in our relationships. Or we suppress, we suppress, we suppress, those energies have to come out one way or another, they start seeping out and showing up as bodily symptoms, as, as heart attacks, cancer, stomach ulcers. So, so, so critically important that we get this relationship to power healed as well as our relationship to our emotions. Well, I'm glad you clarified because for a minute there, I, I thought that you were saying that um, there was no difference between men and women, but it sounds like that's not what you're saying. No, no, there are definitely differences. Like, like there are layers of suppressing and giving away power that 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 apply to women. I, th I think because women, you know, because of the way that that the whole world has viewed power and what power is, you know, we we can see it. You know, in our political leaders, you know, they they kind of not all that's changing. Like we see it changing even in the last 10 years, but, but there's like a rejection of the feminine. Like in, you see it in, in the way that some of our leaders dress and the way they do their hair, um, that they, they act more in a masculine way. And I, Hillary Clinton, I, and this is not about politics or whether you like her or whether you don't, or whether you love her, like, but she's a good example. And, and the first time around when she was um, going against Obama, um, understandably, like, you know, she, probably i don't know if somebody told her whether this was subconscious she probably thought that to be to to be seen as as a credible leader of of the free world that she had to be tough so she was she acted tougher and more hawkish and got to go do this and you're like and and in, in that you know traditional uh, stereotypical male way you got to go kick butt and that kind of thing whereas obama interestingly embodied more of the feminine principles of, you know, everybody at the table, dialogue, we can talk this out. Um, and no surprise to me uh, that people all over the world, not only, not only in this country, like demonstrations in the hundreds of thousands when he got elected, 
And I think that part of what it was that we all long for this different expression of power. Um, you know, flash forward uh, to the last election cycle in, in 2016, not the last one, but the, the next to last one, when she was going up against Trump. By this time, she had a lot more experience under her belt. She had been Secretary of State. She had been Senator. And I'm making all this up, right? This is just my observations. I've never spoken to her. Um, but it seemed to me that she felt a lot more confident in who she was and that she had now a lot more experience and a lot more credibility. So she, there was a visible softening in, 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 the, in, like the, in the color palette that she wore, softer in the hairstyle. She spoke about love and her grandchildren. Um, so there was definitely a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think it uh, works very well when women try to be more masculine than men. But it, it seems to me that that's kind of um, the place that we find ourselves because women are more educated. Um, increasingly, they're earning more than men. Still men do still make more, but it's more common for a woman to make more than it used to be. And that's definitely a power shift. But as that's happening, I think out of necessity, because guys haven't been showing up in their masculinity what does that do to masculinity then and exactly that's a really important point um because that that does have a profound sociological effect so yeah i forget the numbers exactly they're in the book but i think i think i forget what, what the year was you know a few years ago when they when they last did the study in i think we're approaching 40 percent it was either 30 or 40 percent of heterosexual households where the woman is now earning more than the man yeah. and more than half i think just a couple of years ago more than half of college graduates are now women so there is definitely a power shift happening as we speak and so combined with the fact that you know so many jobs are being outsourced so many traditional jobs that men fulfilled and are also being replaced by by machines and by computers a lot of men are ha in having this crisis, this existential crisis. If, if I'm not my job, if I'm not the provider, then who am I? Mm -hmm. And so that's why we see so many men of a particular, um, you know, class of, 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 of men who are reverting backwards and they're looking backwards. And, and yeah, let's go back to the 50s, to the way things were, when things were so much more clear. And, and when I was at the, you know, the top of the heap, um, but it's impossible, right? It's impossible to go back to, and so and so that explains some of this desire in so many in so many a certain percentage of our uh, of our community and society to to look for towards a more you know autocratic, dictatorial, tell me what to do, uh, like going backwards kind of way. Um, it's, I think the outcome is kind of an inevitable as as society continues evolving and opening. Uh, but so that's why I also include a chapter like the, the book has a particular message for the empowerment of women, you know, stemming from what I said before. Um, and I also added a chapter particularly for men, what, what it means to be a man in the 21st century, because we need to we need an upgrade in, in how we hold uh, masculinity and just like a software uh, update, um, because the way that we've, we've been um defining what it means to be a man is we've outgrown it and so for example i look at that role of provider and kind of look at it apply it to 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 current times and and are we really going to identify as men like is our worth um as men is what is our definition of what it means to be a man related to the size of our paycheck it's like come on really that that's how we're going to limit the, what it means to be a man. And there are other ways that we can provide, that we can, that we can assume these traditional roles that men have always provided. So, for example, what about providing a safe psychological and emotional space in which your family, your spouse can thrive, in which they can discover who they are and live their life to the fullest? What about providing stability, becoming a rock in your family structure so that sharing the wisdom, the strength that comes from self-knowledge and the willingness to do the work of self-healing? Um, what about providing a, like a space of unconditional love, support, praise, allowing room for mistakes and imperfections so, so that 
those around us can can thrive and and learn self love and self acceptance that is priceless and and sure. so much more important than than a paycheck um, and and it also entails like being willing to go within right so the another role that that men have traditionally played is that of the explorer and you know there aren't that many places left on this rock of ours um, to explore unless you go deep, deep into the, the, the deepest oceans or out into outer space. And most of us are not going to have an opportunity to do that. But what about exploring the universe within each one of us? You know, what about taking that, that greatest adventure and exploring that world that for the most part remains unexplored and, and in which the answers to all our questions and to all of our problems lie? What about doing that? What about conquering, right? Another another role that men have always played, the conqueror. What about conquering yourself, your fears, your insecurities, your inner demons, your self-doubt, your own obstacles to love? Like, now we're talking. <laughs> I love that you talk in terms of archetypes. I do, too. I think it's super useful. Um, one of the ones that you bring up in your book, too, is the green man. And that might be kind of unknown to people. Can you talk about that one? Which one now? The Green Man? The Green Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of the, you know, you can probably know more about it than I do. Um, it's, you know, one of the 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 pantheistic um archetypes. Um, you know, that that's found in, in a lot of the um, uh, of you know the 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 kind of the words are escaping the indigenous um traditions. Um, it's a, and it's a symbol of, of nature, a symbol of a rebirth, um, you know, a symbol, symbol of, the, you know, it's part of the natural vegetation deities that are found in, in many cultures around the world. Yeah, I think it's important that people have a model, you know, and I, I love the archetypes because it they embody certain energies, but I don't know if there is one for guys that has the whole package. Do you? Do you? You know, in terms of those archetypes, I don't know that there's one. You know, I, one of the ones that I that I write about and, and that speak to me is the the servant leader. You know, the servant king, um, because it is so connected to to transmuting our relationship to power, um, and it kind of turns everything upside down. And 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 a lot, interestingly, a lot of the not a lot, but more and more the the, the literature. Um, on leadership recently is headed more in that direction. So rather than this, um, you know, traditional uh, leader, you know, top down and I'm going to tell you what to do and it's my way or the highway, it's it's a different approach now, um, increasingly. And and so I love that. To me, I think that that servant leader, the servant king or the servant queen archetype is it's very timely and appropriate for our for our times. Yeah, that's definitely a shift. Um, Lao Tzu has a quote about that leading from behind, which I think for me, that works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What would you say to the guy who, we talked about the women who are, are trying to be more masculine than men, but I see it working the other way too, where guys are so fed up with the toxic masculinity that they go super soft and don't want to be men, even to the point of identifying as pansexual, bisexual, or, or even one, and I work in trauma, so <laughs> just to give yeah. that some context, wanting um, a sex change. So what do you, what would you say to the guys who kind of see masculinity as toxic and express it as self-loathing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're talking about a lot of different things in there, um, where, you know, like, sexual preference and um, gender identity are different conversations sure. uh, mm -hmm. different issues but but what you talk about this confusion about what it means to be a man i think that's definitely relevant and, and i hear that from you know women friends all the time that especially in the especially in the in the more spiritual community um that they find, you know, they they find that a lot of men who reject that traditional, um, you know, toxic masculinity way of being, that they've gone too soft. I think that is is a different conversation, and 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 so you know that, that I guess what I say about that 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 you got to find your own way of expressing it, right? That that it, that we don't require what's good and sexy and powerful about being a man. 
um, and, and that is not so much about external roles or, or what you do with whom that to me it's more about being in touch with these energies that, you know that that are all around us and that inform all of us um, and that animate all of us and and so there are certain qualities of the masculine that are, that are incredibly sexy um, and powerful and that we don't need to give those up um, and you know like the, the like the, the for example the, the the element of of seducing or conquering in bed and not in a not in that traditional you know conquering you know just another notch on my bed post kind of thing but 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 the the part of us that that in bed is more um I don't know, you know, penetrative for lack of another word, more not aggressive because that's not the word either, but more assertive, more about taking charge about, and it's about service. Um, it's not just about getting ourselves off. It's, it's more about, you know, I think, I think about, you know, what, what makes us good lovers, men or women, but, but being a man, you know, that's obviously no more about that. Um, and, and it's, to me, it's it, there's a part there's a part of it that's about service that that it's not when we approach sex, just about getting ourselves off like like anybody can do that right and and it's not not fulfilling, but but if we can approach it as like the, like there's an element of service like here here's a, here's a great image there's a book called The Universe Is a Green Dragon by Brian Swim and and what he does he's a physicist a cosmologist and he applies some of the principles that govern the, the stars, that govern the cosmos to the human experience. Because much to the surprise of some humans, we are part of the cosmos. So we are ruled by the same principles that, that govern the stars. So, so he gives the example and, and in a beautiful way of uh, the principle of cosmic generosity. You know, and he gives the example of a supernova. When a supernova explodes when, and gives up its life, give, gives up its form, what happens as a result of that ultimate act of generosity? You know, planets and stars and systems, life occurs. And he talks about how more than 99.999% of the atoms in our bodies are the, exactly the same atoms that are found in the stars. That we So that we can literally say, not in airy fairy kind of way or even poetically it's like we are literally made of star stuff we are literally star beings and so that means that we too are you know are hardwired for cosmic generosity and, and this is my my speaking now you know so what if we applied that cosmic generosity in bed and so rather than approaching it to get get off to 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 seek pleasure for ourselves, what what if we have, what if we gave our, ourselves away in, in the act of love making? And so, and this applies to anybody. So, if we are in the more you know quote unquote masculine active mode, um, then it, it's about finding pleasure points and, and spots in that other body that they didn't even know they had. So it's about almost playing that body as as a, an exquisite. Um, musical instrument and energy comes and energy flows so when the energy flows and, the, and now we're more in a more receptive receiving mode the more traditionally way the ways that we think of the feminine um, then we give our, ourselves away in that way right it's like like here i am take me um, and we can all play with those energies no matter what kind of body we're in so i'm agreeing with that and we live in a world where you look on, I don't do media, I, I, as much as possible, I stay away from it. But, you know, you watch movies, you see these horrible stories where women are beat up, they're treated as sex object, and, and conquering, like you said, is glorified for men in rites of passage. It's about the, the, when a boy becomes a man, it's when he has sex for the first time. When a girl becomes a woman, it's when she menstruates. That's, those are two really different yeah. messages. So how do we shift that? I mean, it, it looks like an uphill battle to me. Yeah, yeah, we, we, it's, it's not easy for sure. Uh, and, and the ways that I write about being are, you know, I, it's, it, this book is part of a series of three. Uh, the, the title of the series is Calling All Heroes. So what does it mean to live a heroic life in the 21st century? 
and, and so yeah n- it's not easy um it's it's not easy and and to go back to the conquer thing i mean if if we're defining our masculinity by how many women we can quote unquote conquer it's like come on dude um you know there is so much more about about what it means to be a man than mm-hmm. another notch on the bedpost um so that's a, a very limited um understanding and perspective of, of what it means to be a man um and you know sometimes you're right like like when sometimes when i look at the world and the shape that it's in and the environmental crisis and and terrorism and how do we even bridge the chasm in this polarized world to to and and, and connect with people who who things that that you know who are demonizing each other um and in some cases don't even think that we're human it's like sometimes i think you know what i'm just gonna go to the beach and have a lot of sex and eat a lot of dark chocolate <laughs> and and then I reel myself back and I said, all right, dude, chill out. Um, what can I do? Right. So rather than being overwhelmed by the, by the hugeness of, of the problems that we're facing as a species, I, I reel, uh, like reel myself back and I ask myself, what can I do? Um, and, and the answer is always the same. Like I continue waking myself up and healing myself and stepping into my power and stepping into my potential and, and, and doing that fully. And I can continue helping as many people as I can to do the same. And hopefully, you know, the, I'm kind of banking on this critical mass thing. You know, like I know that the hundredth monkey um, story technically turned out to be a myth that it didn't quite work out the, the way that the story goes. Uh, but I still f- believe that there's something about the critical mass that enough of us get it and enough of us wake up and, and that then hopefully it'll be like, um, like, like easier for the rest of, of humanity to, to wake up. Mm-hmm. Do you have any stories of um, people that you know who maybe came from a dark place, maybe they were targeting women for sex crimes, violence, or, or just not living up to their potential power-wise in some sort of way um, where you've seen that happen in real life? Are you talking about men specifically or, or? Oh, it doesn't have to be men, but I was hoping for a man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there's so many, so many stories about, um, you know, about that. You know, I can't right now, I can't think of, of, of a man who came from that really oppressive, abusing women. I, I don't think most of those guys who are living at that level would, would, would be ready for the kind of work that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, you know, like the majority of, of people who come to my work are, are women, you know, probably 65, 70%. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably across the board for, for this kind of spiritually based transformational work. I, I do feel hopeful, though, in, in that lately I'm seeing more men um, and, and that I'm seeing more and more men that, that are limiting themselves by these stereotypical, um, uh, twisted, um, ways of, of what it means to be a man. I think it has to be both the men and the women. I know that there's lots of prophecies that say that it's women who is going to lead us out of this. And, and I see the the basis for that, but I don't think it can happen without the men. And I, like you, I don't see as many men coming for help in that direction. And I think that's part of the problem. I don't know if it's like, we don't ask for directions, you know, we don't ask for help, that kind of thing. Uh, it's maybe not acceptable. I don't know why there's the guys don't show up. I think it's a combination of those things that you're saying. I think those are definitely factors. Uh, I think it's also the fact that, you know, the power structure for the last several thousand years has favored men. So they kind of had it made, um, even though, as as we're now discovering and speaking about today, they have been definitely paying a price for yeah. For the way that they have been living, and and I think more and more men are beginning to realize that, and you know realize that how many more examples do you need? Do we need um, that you can have all the power, all the money in the world, and you can be miserable? You can be so thin-skinned and have such a horrible sense of self-worth and and such an evident uh, lack of self-esteem and and so much self-hatred that your sense of self is so dependent on one tweet um, and what other people think of you that hopefully more and more are becoming aware of that, that, that the only source of happiness, that the only sense of satisfaction and fulfillment can come from within. 
And the sooner we get that, the better, because how many of us have been looking for that in a relationship, like looking for that in another? And, you know, that's what my second book that I'm working on now uh, of the series is about. It's about real conscious relationships. Um, because if we're approaching a relationship with that, like you're going to make me happy, like hang it up, forget <laughs> it, because there isn't anybody out there that's going to make us happy. And how unfair to put that responsibility on somebody else. You yeah. are going to make me happy. It's like, so forget it. Hang it up. Doomed to fail. Um, and, and so, so that, you know, just, just to, 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 to highlight the point that all the, all the problems, all the, the answers to all our problems, to all our questions are inside or within. And, and I don't see a way around, around that. So what would you say are the paths to soulful power? Well, um, I would say, you know, that is starting there, self-awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's why, you know, the, the, they used to, they used to put at the entrance to the temples in the old days, know thyself. Um, and, you know, to, I don't see a way around that. Like, you know, I'm not dogmatic about many things, maybe two or three. And not really dogmatic because if you could show me a different way to, to think about it, I'm open to it. But the more, as I see it now, if you want to be free, if you want to step into your power and have, a, have relationships that work and have a life that is filled with meaning and purpose, you've got to go within. You've got to look, you got to know yourself. Like, even like it's almost cliche to say that if you, if if you want to be loved and if you want to love you've got to love yourself first and and if the only way to do that is by knowing yourself like really knowing yourself so i don't i don't see a way around that um and so any thing that we can do to increase our self awareness right so to figure out to understand why we do the things we do why we get stuck in these self defeating self sabotaging behavior patterns and relationships that sometimes feel like we're in the same boring play with the same boring movie with a different actor but it's like we've been here before mm -hmm. so why do we think we do why do we attract certain people into our lives why do we attract certain patterns and relationships there's only one way to figure that out and that's by by going within and, and looking at ourselves and it's hard right it's a lot easier to just Go through life and numbing out and running away from ourselves and 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 numbing out and in, in, in all the creative ways that we do, whether it's drugs or alcohol or or sex or workaholism or gaming with your computers or or exercise or shopping or TV, all the ways that we used to numb out and not think and not feel. But we know, you know, that stuff, like we just can't run away from that stuff. It doesn't go away. We can't sweep it under a rug. And, and it's still, even if we're not dealing with it consciously, it's still having an impact on our lives, the quality of our lives and the quality of our relationships. So I, there's no way around it, right? So to me, that's the first and the most important step is like, know yourself, know why, like spend some time investigating and, and looking at yourself and understanding the patterns. That's why I spend the first, you know, probably quarter of the book talking about the ego mind um, to help us understand how it works and how it keeps us in a self-made prison uh, so that we can break ourselves free because nobody else can do that for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At Pan Society, we say the same. The foundation is sovereignty. It's, it definitely starts with you because you got control over nothing else. Yep. Um, you talk about specific things like forgiveness. What, what would you, what do you call those things? Yeah, I call them path to power. So, you know, that's, that's interesting that you picked up on that because that's the, the second one that, that I'm dogmatic about. Um, and again, because I don't see a way around it. Um, because if we're holding somebody over the fire, uh, you know, for what they did or failed to do, our hand is also getting burnt. That's right. Uh, so, you know, like we've heard it before, it's like forgiveness is really for us. Um, and, and another way to, to, to think about it visually, if we think of the heart center, you know, the heart chakra um, as sort of like the iris of the eye or the shutter of a camera that opens and closes to allow more or less light in, or in this case, more or less love in, we can't shut it selectively. 
right? We can't just shout it to the ex who left us for somebody else or the boss who fired us or mom who did this or dad who didn't do that. Or we, or we can't just shut it selectively. If we shut it, we shut it. And, and so to me, that's another one of these, these journeys to power. You know, if, if, and because the thing is like, if we're doing that, we're still giving our power away. And and so so the other one is you know it's the path of it is like so going within forgiveness the third thing that I'm that I'm dogmatic about is the victim you know popping out of the victim mindset victim consciousness mm -hmm. and that's tough that is probably the toughest one to pop out of because it is a level of consciousness um, and but the thing is if, if we are holding anyone responsible or anything for that matter any system responsible for our state of being for our happiness for our success it's like we're just giving our power away again and you know so as long as we're blaming mom or dad or the teacher or the minister or the rabbi or or the or, or the therapist or a system right as long as we're blaming uh sexism or misogyny or racism or homophobia and, and not to deny any of those things, right? Those things are real, and the system is set up unfairly. Uh, so it's not about that. It's just saying that as long as we're ho holding something or someone outside of us responsible for our happiness, it's like we just gave our power away, and often, tragically, to the perpetrator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a way around that one either. Yeah, I think some people get that, and for others, it's a gigantic challenge. It, it's huge. And, and here's a way that, that helps to, to, to understand that and to reframe that. Like one thing we know, one thing we can count on is that life is going to continue throwing curveballs our way, right? Things are going to happen that we didn't see coming. Um, and so, so it's easy. It's almost normal to, to have this victim relationship with life, right? What life did to me. Poor me. Woe is me if it only hadn't been this way. Uh, if, I, if I'd only had been born in this other situation, in this other culture, in this other socioeconomic status, if only, if, 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 right? If I had more, you know, more hair or, or bigger boobs or bigger whatever, uh, right? If, uh, but, but whenever we're holding that relationship with life, we're just like completely disempowering ourselves and victim, like keeping ourselves in victim mode. So whereas we just kind of reframe that and said, all right, well, that sucked. I wish it hadn't been that way. And like, what am I going to do in response, right? How, how am I going to show up in response to that? And, and so no matter what happened in our past, and it's not minimizing anybody's pain, anybody's tra trauma, like things happened that should have never happened to, to us. Uh, right? So it's not about that. It's like, it sucked. And I'm sorry that it happened. And so no matter what happened, no matter what happens coming forward, we always get to choose how we show up in response to it. Yeah. And that alone, that simple reframe changes everything. Yeah. Another one that you uh, talk about is vulnerability, which I think is a challenge for some people in the same way. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. That's another one of those paths to power, which is the path of, of vulnerability. Which, which goes back to what we're talking about, you know, this, this toxic way of being, which somewhere along the way we've got, we got confused. And we think that to be strong, to be powerful, we got to walk around like these robots with layers and layers of armors. And, and we walk around in such a defensive state of being, you know, just, just like in DEFCON 1, just like, you know, like constantly like in super protected uh, and constantly anticipating the next blow from from life, and and you know we think that's powerful, but but that's not powerful. If we think about it, when we walk around like this with crossed arms in in hyper, you know hyper protected state, that is actually a prison. Like and sometimes we like sneak in a punch to to you know preemptively just in case. It's like what a way to live. That's like like no wonder we're walking around in such states of stress and anxiety. Um, and, and that then we then have to medicate those things um, in unhealthy ways that don't resolve the ultimate issues. So to me, it's like when, if you can visualize just opening our crossed arms, and which is a more vulnerable place to be, it's actually more powerful because what that signifies is our relationship to life is like, you know what, life, I got this. Like no matter what you throw my way, 
I'm going to be okay. I'm going to land on my feet and I'll figure a way through it. Like I've gotten this far. I know that I will continue figuring this out. And, and so that is a much more counterintuitively empowered place to be. And then we don't have to walk around in such a defensive state all the time. Um, and, and not stupidly, like we don't like, it doesn't mean that we walk around with our open heart with somebody who's cheated on us three times or betrayed us five, right? Is that we're not stupid about this. Um, and it doesn't mean that, that, you know, if we're being accosted at gunpoint or knife point in a dark alley, it, it doesn't mean that we say, oh, you know what? This really doesn't work for me. You know, it's like we hand over the, the freaking wallet um, at that point. Um, so it doesn't mean like we approach this stupidly, um, but we but but our basic foundational foundational relationship to life and to other humans is openness, is is one of vulnerability, which is actually more powerful way of being. And do you have a personal story of how you used any of these um, paths to power, how it's transformed your life? Um, yeah, so many. Um, in terms of, of, yeah, you know, it's like, like, I can tell you, I can tell you a couple of stories that from, from people who have come to my, my retreats, I'm not, the one, the ones that I'm thinking of personally, like would take too long for this podcast, probably like a 10 minute story, mm -hmm. um, which are great, but we don't have the time for that. But there are a couple of simple ones that to illustrate that um, a, a woman who had had a falling out with her grandmother who was really her had raised her. So she was really her mother figure and they hadn't spoken in years. And at the end of a retreat, after several breathwork sessions, she was able to forgive her. Like the last session on Sunday, she finally forgave the grandmother for, I forgot what, what, what had happened. Come Monday, the grandmother called her like, and so that addresses, you know, one of the one of the principles that you also teach in, in animism is like the interconnectedness of it all. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. How do how did the grandmother know um, that it was okay now that it was safe now to reach out? Mm -hmm. um, another another story, somebody who who you know, to to like kind of illustrate vulnerability. Um, a woman who had been married, you know, probably I don't know, 20, 30 years, I forget, and she. I got into one of her pet peeves that her husband and, and she would always argue about is like he would get home and he would put the keys in the quote unquote wrong place, put them on the counter, wherever he put them. And so, you know, he would do this and she would then shut down and, and start, um, you know, sarcasm or, or, or nagging him or, or, you know, acting out passive aggressively or, or they would get into an argument. Um, and they'd done it for years, you know, that boring, boring merry-go-round that done a thousand times. He would do this, she would do that. He would do this, she would do that. Uh, 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 uh. Boring. How many times have we done that? So after having just a couple of, of um, I think this was a, a, an eight-week course that I was teaching with a group of women, um, I think we were like maybe a third or fourth session, she just, he, he got home and she didn't react. Like she brought choice back into the equation and she said you know what what's the big deal i'm not going to react i'm i'm you know because she was taking it personally mm -hmm. like like he wasn't caring for her he wasn't listening to her like she wasn't feeling her she wasn't feeling listen uh, her listened to she wasn't feeling respected that was really the core wound not it wasn't about the freaking keys it was really her feelings of not being considered which was those feelings were way older than her marriage. You know, she could trace it back to childhood when she was able to do that work of, of looking within and understanding the patterns. And so once she did that, it's like, all right, what's the big deal? It's not the way that I want it, but I'm going to choose my battles. <laughs> and these keys are not worth it. Getting into an argument about, so, you know, happened, happened once, happened three times, and she just didn't react. And what happened the next week? He just got home. And he put him in the right place <laughs> right? because that ego hadn't that that didn't even realize that it was an ego and why it was doing the ways that it, that it was doing and why it got stuck in a power struggle um, had nothing to buck up against. Right. So that there was no resistance, nothing to fight, nothing to rebel against. Right. And so got bored, put him in the right place. Yeah. 
Well, I'm glad you brought up the breath work and the having to do your work because none of this is easy. I mean, it's not like snap your fingers. Oh, I have gratitude, you know, right. <laughs> especially when you're dealing with stuff that's, that is so old and childhood stuff and, and lots of times stuff you don't even know that is there. So yeah, it is a process. It's a process and it's not an easy one. It's, it's nothing yeah. short of heroic, but it is so worthwhile because in our willingness to do that and having the courage to look within and to face ourselves and face our inner demons, we free ourselves. Like we completely free ourselves. Mm -hmm. So can you um, tell us again, the name of the book and how people can contact you? Yeah, sure. Laura, thank you. Um, the book is titled awakening the soul of power and it's available on Amazon or at your local bookstore, wherever books are sold um, in terms of reaching me, probably the website is the best way. And from there, they can connect through social media. And my website is soulfulpower.com. And for your listeners right now, if they go to that website to soulfulpower.com and sign up to be on my email list, and, and you know we all know how easy it is to unsubscribe at any point if you choose to down the road. But, but when they sign up to be on my email list, they will receive a chapter from the book, a sample chapter. They'll get some power practices that are designed to integrate and to apply those teachings to our lives because we don't need more information. We've, we've got information overload. What we need is transformation, and that's what those practices are designed to do, to, to apply the teachings uh, so, that, so that our lives transform. Um, and then they'll also get a, a guided uh, teaching and meditation um, about trust, which is one of those other paths to power that we were talking about. Um, and very helpful in these uh, chaotic and uncertain times. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Christian. Uh, thank you so much, Laura, for, for having me. And thank you for, do the, the, for doing the work that you do. I know that it impacts a lot of lives. Thank you. Thank you. So that's our show for this week. Everything we do is about connection, self-discovery, and community, and taking that awareness with us everywhere and, and everything we do. If you want to continue your journey with Pan Society, check us out on our Facebook page, Twitter, YouTube, or blog. And you can see Christian De La Huerta at soulfulpower.com. Thank you all for joining us for this edition of Pan Society Radio. My thanks to the elements and ancestors. So grateful for all of you being here and tuning in. And I'll see you next week. Thank you.